as I said, uh, today we're going to be looking at um, the topic of how to choose an Aikido teacher. Now, this topic is usually for somebody who's looking for an Aikido teacher, a beginner. But I, I guess most people in my audience are actually already in Aikido, and maybe you know, there's many people that are teaching Aikido. Many of us are students. Maybe you're a student and also somehow teaching as well. And or like I know Mandy's, uh, she she was a professional school teacher, some sort of school teacher, and uh, also an Aikido student. I think she even taught some Aikido back in the day. She had a long break, and now she's back in Aikido. And um, this is a topic that I, I I see it as a very important topic because you know. Basically, there's two types of teachers. You know, you can look at these very generalization. One teacher is like an instructor. You know, imagine you go to a, a cooking class or a driving instructor or um, you learn how to play the guitar. And, um, you know, some even teachers who are instructors that are just teaching us how to take on more knowledge, they can profoundly affect our life. But basically, their the relationship is about teaching us a, a new skill and then we take that skill and we go forward in life. That's one type of teacher. The other type of teacher is a transformational path teacher, a teacher, a person who teaches us how to walk along a path of transformation. And um, the main, there's a very different uh, relationship, a very different uh, weight in our life. And the main difference is that the, the, the transformational teacher, to some degree, to a certain degree, to, a, to an important degree, takes on the karma of the student. So they're like in it with you. You know, they are engaged and they are leading you beyond your comfort zone. They comfort zone. They are leading you into your potential. And, and that's a kind of a karmic relationship. And they and in that relationship a lot of things are going to happen. You're going to go through uh highs and lows and 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 hell and heaven and everything and the teacher is meant to kind of the teacher or the teaching or the teacher and the teaching is meant to kind of usher you through that. So that's the type of teacher I'm mostly speaking about in this, uh, in this uh, talk. And um, uh, so when we're looking at how to choose a teacher, you'll see as I lay this out, um, it does apply to driving instructors and everything else, but it's mostly about a, a, a path teacher. Aikido is a path. A path, from my perspective, is a higher path, a higher path of physical a higher path of uh, uh, emotional, a higher path of mental or intellectual, and a higher path of spiritual discipline. And that's the type of teacher that, that uh, in the teacher-student relationship that I'm going to talk about today. So uh, I will dive right in. First, let's just look at the question, you know, why do we need a teacher? Well, um, I, I want to quote uh, Mirabai Starr, who's a, um, she's an author, a spiritual teacher and an author. She's written several books around spirituality. And she has a beautiful quote here. She says, To get to an unknown land by unknown roads, a traveler cannot allow himself to be guided by his old experience. So to get to an unknown road by an, an unknown land, our future potential, by an unknown road, a path, a traveler cannot allow himself to be guided by his old experience. He has to doubt himself and seek the guidance of others. There is no way he can teach, excuse me, there is no way he can reach the new territory and know it truly unless he abandons familiar roads. A caterpillar cannot go through a metamorphosis into a butterfly until it goes through the process and the, the, the culmination of abandoning everything that's caterpillar to become a butterfly. This is why we need teachers. You know, it, 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 some people do kind of make it through those, those, those they go by unknown land and they reach and, and unknown roads and they reach uh, their potential, their greater potential. But for most of us, it, it, it requires some sort of guidance to one to rear the other. So why do we need a teacher? You know, teachers represent our very own potential. You know, when you see a teacher and you go, wow, and you're just drawn to that teacher. A teacher represents your very own potential that is coming to you from the future to meet you in the present. So I'm going to say that again. When you see a teacher, when you're inspired by somebody, what you're actually seeing, not the man or the woman or the, the Aikido teacher, the meditation teacher, whatever kind of teacher, what you're actually seeing is you're seeing your potential. Your potential is saying, hey, come you're seeing your own potential that is coming to meet you from the future and meeting you in the present moment. 
This is one of the reasons we needed a, a teacher. And, a, you know, a, a teacher is a living manifestation of a path of practice that is alive. And we need to see that. You know, if we're just repeating forms, that path can be kind of dead, uh, unanimated, not not alive and juicy. A teacher is a living manifestation of that. And, and another reason we need a teacher is that they show us this path. And, um, you know, they show us this path where, in a way, for you and me, as we go along the path, what they ask us to do is kind of counterintuitive. In other words, if I'm left to my own devices, I won't do the things that a teacher asks me to do. I won't do the things that a teacher pushes me to do. I won't do the things that a, that a teacher holds me in their loving embrace and encourages me to do. Say, yes, go forward. I wouldn't do that. It's counterintuitive. So I need a teacher to kind of show me this is where you see that place you don't want to go. See that thing that you don't want to look at. See that fear that's holding you back. Well, guess what? That's the path. We go forward with there. So that's one of the reasons we need a teacher. Another reason we need a teacher is that they simultaneously let us know that we, we must walk the path to, to realize our, our, our potential. And they serve as a living expression of the potential that we walk towards. So I'll say it again. So there's, there's two things that are happening simultaneously. They let us know that we must walk this path. So we, let's say we reach the edge of our comfort zone and we're in that kind of discomfort zone and we just don't want to, everything in us is no. They say, well, guess what? Yes, this is, you know, it can be, it can be through challenge. It can be through support, you know, with wisdom, like you do it, uh, you know, tough love, like take that step or with compassion, like beautifully holding you and just kind of supporting you in your process. They let us know that look, this is your path. And simultaneously, they manifest, they actually radiate that which we are walking towards. So they stand there and say, hey, you're doing great, keep going forward. And then they manifest at the same time uh, what we're going towards. And that actually acts as a support. So they, they show us our potential and they, 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 they manifest the potential at the same time. They're a living expression of the potential that we walk towards. And for this reason, uh, the teacher relationship is an empowering relationship and it's one of the it's a relationship that makes all the difference in our lives um you know you guys may be leaving some comments but i just wanted to say let me do a quick check here yeah i better turn that on i want to make sure that i can follow the comments huh? okay yeah Okay, sorry about that uh, break. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and teach. If there's questions, I'll, I'll, I'll review all the questions at the end, and I'll, we'll, we'll take a little bit of time. But I want to kind of go through my my list of teaching uh, without break for just uh, the beginning, and then we'll we'll get to your questions at the end if you have any questions. So just feel do feel free to write those down. So that that's why we need a teacher. Now let's look at what does a teacher do for us? Yeah. Uh, what a teacher does for us, there are some, some Aikido teachers have a profound capacity to express the spiritual depths um, that are the principles of Aikido. You know, Aikido is not, uh, sorry, the principles of Aikido are not on the surface. They're not on the surface forms and the techniques. They actually come from a deeper place. And, and many, there are many wonderful Aikido teachers that have a great capacity to, to express these deep spiritual principles. Uh, and effective, and that's, some, that, that's an inspiration for us. They actually ma they model for us how we, not just how we can do things, but how we can be while we do things. Uh, and other teachers have a high level of skill to express, um, uh, excuse me, yeah, so other teachers have a, a, a capacity to express the spiritual deaths, while some other teachers have a high level skill to uh, express the, the technical uh, um, the technical aspects of the art. So some would be more profound, you know, uh, demonst uh, de profoundly demonstrating the, the principles, while others will be really um, skillfully demonstrating the, 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 the technical skill of the art. And then some teachers, an effective teacher is able to convey both of these, the depth and the, the complexity that is the art of Aikido. So that's actually what they can do. They, they can show us both how to be technically sharp and how to manifest the principles and how to bring those together in integration. <clears throat> teachers can further help a student uh, to integrate these principles into their life, so from the dojo into the world, in a way that is culturally and developmentally appropriate. So what I mean by culturally appropriate, I mean, you know, a teacher can te teach you how to be a, a Japanese samurai, like in all the, you know, the good, the true, and the beautiful of the samurai. But is that culturally appropriate to who you are and where you live? So an effective teacher 
is not just going to teach you how to be a specific way in the dojo, but how to manifest that and how to kind of bridge that into your daily life. Um, uh, a teacher can transmit universal principles in a way that the student can get it in their own experience. So this is creating ability in a student. The digits don't have these amazing skills, these amazing capacities, this amazing expression, but they can take that, transmit it, and help to create an ability for students uh, to get that as well. Uh, teachers have access to the absolute. Now, when I mean the absolute, let's just say the principles, the universal principles that are that are um, that are with us that are available at all times, in all places, in all circumstances. And they have a way to access these principles and demonstrate and express these principles at all times, in all places, in all circumstances, without being absolutistic. Now, what does that mean? That means um, they don't say that this is the only way to do it. You know, they have their way of doing Aikido, their technical style. As we all know, there's many styles. But a, a mature teacher understands that the technical form and the principle are not the same thing. If this glass is the technical form, the room, indeed, all of Tel Aviv, indeed, all of the Middle East, indeed, all of the world is the principles. There's no comparison to the size and the weight and the value of these two things. Yet, we can only see the technical form. So it's easy to have a mistake. But a good teacher will show you this, but also express that which is greater. And, um, you know, if you do work with a teacher, one of the reasons that that teacher is very helpful is that they can actually help us save a lot of time on our path. You know, we can try hard by ourselves, but a teacher will show you the easiest steps um, to get there. And uh, for sure, working with a teacher will accelerate your development. And even though um, it's a wonderful experience, uh, working with a teacher can be intense and it can be challenging, but it's one of the most supportive relationships that we can uh, find. And remember, the type of teacher that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, is the type of teacher that takes on the karma of the student. You know, they're, they're, they're in this with you in this higher path of practice. It's not just how to do a technical skill, but this is a path of practice, a transformational path. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you five ways, five things to look at when choosing a teacher. But just remember, I do want to say something that in this type of relationship that I'm speaking about, a transformational relationship, not teaching you just skill, but teaching you a way of being, and, and not just a way of being, a way of life, but a tr that will transform you into your potential. Um, uh, Robert Fragerson, say many of you know Robert Fragerson, he, he, he's, he's, he's also a Sufi sheikh. You know, he's a spiritual teacher in the Sufi tradition. And he teaches, he says that Sufism, Sufism teaches, um, you know, that, that the, the teacher-student relation in a spiritual function is needs to be pure. It needs to be protected. It needs to be clean. And it's very important that that relationship is preserved. Because if you make a mistake in such a relationship, if there's a um, a transgression or if there's a something breaks in the relationship, the karmic, quants the, the karmic consequences of such a mistake are doubled. It's more than just if you, let's say you lie or cheat or steal or there's a misunderstanding, you have an argument or whatever with somebody, you know, and you transgress and you regret, oh, I wish I didn't do that or whatever. Whatever, there's karma to that. But in a teacher-student relationship, on a path of practice, Aikido is a path practice, so it's a spiritual practice, when there's a problem in a relationship at that level, the karmic consequences are doubled. So we need to really kind of approach this idea of choosing a, a teacher, an Aikido sensei. You know, when somebody actually takes a title, says, "Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to identify, I'm going to express myself, I'm going to show up as a sensei." That needs to be taken very seriously. And when we enter into such a relationship, it requires a lot from the student. It requires trust. Of course, they have to earn the trust, but it requires trust. It requires, uh, sooner or later, it's going to require surrender. That you're going to, the path, and it's not, maybe the teacher is requiring you to surrender, but really it's the path of practice. Your potential, who you want to become, can't become until you let some things go. It will require surrender. It, it will, surrender. It will require a, a good amount of uh, discipline and maybe even a certain amount of obedience. You know, you follow your teachers, you conform to your teacher, and you, and you, you know, you follow them. Um, of course, keeping your free choice all the time. 
and um, and it will never it will require that you that you choose to to follow that path but it will never require that you take away the one empowering choice that you always have and that is the choice to stay in that relationship it's yours and yours alone you can choose to be a student of that teacher you can choose to leave that's the one place that you have power and by surrendering everything else to the teacher and this is an ideal situation surrendering everything else to the teacher and their teaching and the path that they're teaching is an empowering act okay and it's not a trap because you can always choose to walk so I uh, just kind of keep that in mind as I go through these these five ways so here they are uh, five ways to choose a teacher number one know what you want so basically you know you decide to practice Aikido you're going to take on martial art or maybe you're even you took a break for a while you're going to come back or or you've been in one dojo it's not really your cup of tea it's kind of going against your whatever your values or your needs or your wants or whatever or just even doesn't even suit your your practical schedule anymore so you have to change dojos so when you're looking for another dojo and this is a question I get a lot you know for people actually um, you know they have to move or their teacher quits or whatever or they move on and they got to find a new dojo what should I look for well first thing you need to do is you need to understand what you want so um, and there's a few a few a few uh, parameters here you know I, one depends on your level of maturity so every dojo has its own culture now are you looking to take on a new culture are you at the point in your life when you're looking to take on a new culture when I was 25 I moved from Japan Texas where I'm from to Japan and I became Japanese I took it on in fact I even from the time I was 17, 16 17 18 I was already becoming Japanese in Texas which was really weird you know Texas guy walking around as a Japanese I didn't really walk around but I was totally into it and I took on that culture when I moved to Japan, completely took it on. At my age now, 54 years old, I'm not, in, I've, been, I've been there, done that. I don't need to take on any more cultures. Um, so, you know, when it comes to, a, every dojo has its culture, but some, some dojos are more strict and uh, traditionalist and they expect you to be conformist. Some dojos are non-conformist that you can, you know, that you can be or not be. And some, some dojos are post-conformist. Nonconformists and postconformists are not the same thing. Nonconformists could be like, yeah, you've been there, done that, and you're just not conforming anymore because you're mature. It could also be a rebellious stand about, no, I'm not going to conform. So the way it usually works is you kind of conform for a while, and then you you kind of grow out of that, and then you're postconformist. And when you're postconformist, it's easy to kind of do the Japanese thing and the Japanese culture, uh, you know, and, and bow and say and call, you know, call. Everybody in the dojo is sensei or senpai or, or kohai or whatever. It's easy to do that, but you don't have to do that, and you don't, uh, and you don't not, and you don't resist it. So know where you're at. Are you like looking for a, a, a good old tradition, old school dojo that demands a lot of conformity, or are you are you have you kind of been there and done that? Yeah. So that's important to know. Every, every dojo you go in will have a certain amount of regi, a certain amount of etiquette, more or less, and it usually depends on the teacher. Also, know if you're look, if you're looking for a martial path or a spiritual path. So, you know, what do you want? Knowing what you want, it's important. Do you want to go to a martial art? Are you looking for a self development? Are you looking for an empowerment practice? Are you looking for a spiritual path? Because every dojo will be different. Some are strictly about martial arts. Some are some are about they're doing technique, they're doing martial art, but it's actually something else. They're doing something more about self development. So, know what you want and and choose the dojo, the, the dojo and of course the teacher accordingly. Also know if your orientation is more towards external forms outside or if it's more uh, uh, oriented towards inner work, your own inner work. Because if you're really looking for inner development, then it is important that you choose a teacher and a school that's going to support that. If you're like cool there and you just want to get embodied, you want some technical skill, you want to learn how to stay centered, you want to a good posture then you got your own internal practice. You don't need a dojo that does that. Just go and learn the forms. So know what you want in terms of internal and external and integration, by the way. Also know if you're looking for something that's going to uh, be more like a solo path, that you get to go in and do your practice and then go home and you know, develop that way. Or you're looking for a communal path. Like, you're, Is it important for you to have community, a you know, social group? Some dojos are very social. Some it's just business. You go and train, you go. You know, and, and that's cool. And again, it, it'll depend on the teacher. A teacher could be cultivating a big social community. 
a teacher might be teaching individual responsibility, you know, either way. But but know what you want in terms of that when you're when you're looking for a teacher. Um, now, um, also technical or principles oriented. Are you looking again for technical skill, or are you are you looking for something that is going to that is is going to be more principle oriented? Principle oriented practice is is immediately translatable. Immediately translatable. Immediately translatable. If it's not, it's not a principle. You can take that principle and translate it to your life directly. If that's what you're looking for, then you should choose accordingly. Choose a teacher accordingly. And one other thing I would choose here, and sometimes I get in trouble with these words. I don't get in trouble. Some people have a hard time with these words. I, I, I use a lot the words masculine and feminine in, in terms in, in, as, uh, in, as the yin and the yang of Aikido. And I prefer masculine and feminine. Yin and yang is kind of a concept. Masculine, feminine, we all kind of get it. Um, sometimes people reduce me to, you know, being sexist or talking about gender. It's not about gender at all. It's actually, it's, it's, it's the, you know, the, 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 it's the most fundamental duality in Aikido has masculine and feminine in every aspect of it, which is a whole other talk I won't go into. But um, some teachers are going to be more masculine. Other teachers are going, uh, other teachers are going to be more on the feminine side. Masculine is more. Ad- agentic, uh, they're more form-oriented, they're more uh, goal-oriented, they're more structured in their teaching. This could be a man or a woman. There might be a higher, a clear hierarchy, they may be like a, a, a clear leader. Whereas the, a teacher who's more in the feminine aspect, they're going to be much more about communion, communal. It's going to be more, instead of linear, it's going to be much more circular. Instead of structure, it's going to be all about flow. And some people are integrated with both of these things. So, you know, also know your type your masculine type or your feminine type and choose accordingly. You may choose a teacher that that actually leads you forward in your type or you actually may consciously choose a teacher that's embodying the opposite and you want to find some balance. So know that. So number one, when choosing a teacher, know what you want. Point number two, when choosing a a teacher, look for a teacher, a man or a woman who resonates with you. Okay, so, you know, there's going to be this natural resonance. Most people here probably do Aikido. Think of five teachers right now, the first five teachers that pop into your mind, and which one of those teachers attract you? And which one of those teachers are kind of neutral? I mean, they're great, but, you know, they don't, there's no energy there for you. And which one of those, te- and which of those teachers, in a way, kind of put you off? It's like, mm, not really my cup of tea. So it is helpful to find a teacher that resonates with you. Now the Tibetans, you know, the Tibetan Buddhists, they 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 say it's very important to find your your root guru, your root guru, your root teacher, and they see that as a sacred relationship. And when you find your root teacher, again, you know, Tibetan Buddhism is very classical, traditional Buddhism, uh, not Buddhism, spiritual path. When you find that teacher, you stay with them to the end for your life. You stay with them. And um, it's considered bad karma to break teachers and go to another teacher's, unless the teacher sends you, of course. Um, but there's something to that, yeah? You know, we live in a pluralistic period where, wow, there's so many wonderful teachers. In fact, the fourth turning of the wheel is really about networking everything together. And we start to understand that there's a power in, in working with different teachers. But it is important to find somebody that resonates with you. And check around, you know, look around. Um, also, um, you know, uh, it should be somebody who is similar in your, in your, uh, let's say, it resonates in your body physically, what they're doing kind of resonates with you. It could be like you or, or opposite of you. It doesn't matter, but it resonates well. It's also similar cultural values, you know, like they have traditional values that may or not may not be your cup of tea. If they have modern values, it may or may not be your cup of tea. If they have postmodern values, pluralistic values, those may or may not be your cup of tea. So you have to resonate. You know, what? Are, not only what are they doing, but what are they teaching? What values are they sharing in the dojo? Um, we know now from kind of modern uh, learning uh, methodologies that there are different types of learning. And some people learn differently uh, and teach differently from that matter. You know, some people le- learn well kinesthetically, in other words, through the body. Some people learn more conceptually or intellectually through, they need that, they need that, that um, abs- they need to abstract it, got it, and then they can do it. Uh, other people are more relational. They have to feel it, you know, they've got to get in there and feel it from you. You know, you sh- don't just show me, but let me hold you and then you let me feel you do it. 
Uh, some people learn more emotionally, some people learn more spiritually, etc. Different teachers are going to be different teacher types of teaching, or a few different types of teaching, and what is your preferred type? So that's important to, you know, when you're looking for someone that you resonate with, the type of teacher they are and the way they teach. Two more points on this one. Uh, look for somebody that is lovable. This is this is such a, it's a weird, freaky, personal thing, but, you know, if you just think you're a teacher right now, or think of teachers you had in the past, you know, where maybe the relationship didn't go south and it's still good. You know, is there a twinkle in your eye? Is there something that you just love? They're, they're lovable. You know, that they're, it's like, what? you know, okay, I, I, I outgrew that teacher. I moved on or they moved on or they stopped or they passed away or whatever. But, you know, something is my teachers, all my teachers, they they were, well, I had a lot of teachers in my life, but my two main Aikido teachers, Saito Sensei, uh, and, and Bill Sosa, since it was my first Aikido teacher, they were both completely lovable. All the students, it's just like, you know, they, their smile, their, their, their sense of humor, the way they taught, their toughness. These were masculine teachers, by the way. Same thing with my meditation teacher, my core meditation teacher. I kind of have two meditation teachers, but from the same tradition. Saru Pandita and Saido uh, Vivekananda, and they both are just so lovable. And everybody, you know... They scare the shit. Well, Upandita could scare the sh literally scare the the shit out of you, um, you know, just with a look, with a glance. But still, you just can't help. You know, he's just so lovable. So it's important that you find somebody that is lovable, in in whatever way it is, you know, for you. And the last point I'll make here is that it's very important that they are worthy of that love. And this means that their moral and ethical standards are good, solid. They don't transgress. Because, you know, like I said before, when there's a transgression in the teacher-student relationship, the karma is doubled. The karmic consequences is doubled. And that takes a long time, and, you know, it takes time to understand if a teacher is worthy of love, of our love, you know, more than just having a really great shionage, a great personality. But, but these are some things that you should look for. So that's the second point. Once again, I'll review these. The first point is know what you want. You know, your own personal needs, your own personal desires. The second point look, when looking uh, uh, to choose a teacher and choosing a teacher is look for somebody who resonates with you. Okay? So the third point when choosing a teacher is to um, look for a teacher who has lineage. Aikido is um, being a Japanese a, a Japanese art that has been transmitted to, uh, from one generation to generation to generation, three maybe fourth generation now. Um, it's it's a clear lineage, you know, and and everything points back to Saito Sensei. You know, there's you know that's not Saito Sensei, sorry, that's my teacher. Uh, to O Sensei, you know, Saito Sensei somewhere in that tree, in that first generation of students, actually even the second generation of students, and O Sensei is at the top of the tree. So everything points back to O Sensei. And, and that's a lineage. It flows down in different styles, different, but transmission to transmission to end. It's really uh, a beautiful thing. And, you know, most of us, most, most of us and most of the teachers we have, um, you know, were second generation or third generation. If O-sensei was the original and Saito-sensei was the first generation, since Saito-sensei was my teacher, I'm third generation. Um, now, that's gener generationally, it's kind of close to O-sensei, but, you know, I don't consider myself being so close to Osensei, I didn't. I never saw him. I never met him, and my teacher was Saito Sensei completely, and he wasn't Osensei. Um, but still, you know, as you go down the line, you're going to, you know, in a, one way to look at it is that a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, they lose their 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 connection to the to the original copy. But that's actually why it's not what's happening. Each generation is really training and learning new things, and they're bringing new new gifts, and they're adding to the art, and they're bringing more to the art. So if you're connected in a living lineage, uh, if your teacher's connected in a living lineage, they're going to be able to transmit the ancestors through what they're doing, but also add to their add to the knowledge of the art. And that's what you want to uh, try to find somebody that's in. Lineage is a beautiful thing. It's a powerful thing. It happens to be a hierarchy. Yeah? And, you know, we have to be careful with the whole, you know, legacy and hierarchy, hierarchical thing. But, um, hey, Kelly, it's nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Um, but um, that's kind of what happens in lineage. Yeah? And, and a teacher with lineage is, is going to be 
um, are, they're going to actually the ancestors are at our backs you know we, we can give you something that that has more depth that way um, another thing about lineage is that, that they have gained the wisdom of that lineage as opposed to knowledge that you know that the inner transmission the inner teachings have been passed down and passed down and passed down and passed down so you're not just learning technical forms by the way there's many lineages that are dead they keep passing on the forms you can see this particularly in Jap Japan and maybe just one little family or something and they didn't get any new new fresh blood or anything and you look at the forms you think yeah it looks like they're it looks really you know yeah it looks 300 years old it looks 500 years old but what are they doing um but okay they're preserving something there so not a problem but it should be a living lineage that's being passed down a living wisdom it's a, it's a living transmission of uh wisdom of the art it's a living transmission of the principles there's a legacy in, in what's being taught uh, another thing, um, when you look for somebody who has a lineage, you should check to see that they graduated in that lineage. In other words, um, did something happen? Did they break? You know, it shouldn't say did they graduate, how they graduated. If they're teaching, that means that either their teacher told them, okay, now you teach, or something happened and they started teaching. Maybe there was a bad break, and humans are humans, it happens. Maybe they were in Japan for a few years, they came back and or maybe they're training in one dojo, they moved to another place. They just want to do Aikido, so they had to teach. Uh, in a way, if there's a graduation, then they're actually lineage holders, and they're able to kind of take that forward. That's the best situation, if you can find it. If you can't find it, you know, find somebody that's plugged in there. Uh, it's not an absolute, but it's something. It's a very important thing. And I would say one caveat to lineage. One caveat to the lineage is... Um, is that some people have a natural genius. They just they, they were practicing a little bit and then something happened and they actually whoosh, they went beyond their teacher somehow in some way. That has happened. Oh, since they did that. You know, that has happened. Doesn't happen much in J Japan because of the rigid hierarchy, but that has happened. And you know, in that sense the lineage is not connected to a, a series of teachers, but the lineage is, is connected to spirituality itself. So they're 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 transmitting a spiritual lineage at that point. Maybe not of the of the patriarchs. And by the way, this is usually patriarchal. So sorry for the for the women. It's not very balanced in that way. You know, uh, patriarchal hierarchies. Um, but it doesn't have to be. And that's a beautiful expression in the West because there's a lot of amazing women Aikido teachers who do hold lineage and do a beautiful job of transmitting that lineage. So once again, the first three points of for five ways to choose a teacher. The first is know what you want. The second is look for someone who resonates, look for a teacher, a man or woman who resonates with you. It should be some kind of, let's say, spiritual connection that you feel from the beginning. Um, uh, seek out a teacher who has a lineage. That can't go wrong with that. Or you can't go wrong, I'm sorry. But let's say that's a good, it's a good uh, guideline to follow. Number four, fourth, uh, fourth, fourth uh, guideline for uh, when you seeking out a teacher. Look for someone who puts learning and knowledge above preservation. This is so important. Um, again, this is kind of connected to lineage. Um, it's kind of connected to lineage in the sense that, um, well, I'll just use myself as an example. My, my teacher, Saito Sensei, um, was a direct student of O Sensei in Iwama, Japan. He lived with him for, oh my God, 23 years, I think it was, side by side. He was his attendant and training with him, well, not really every day, but every other day because he had a job in the railroad. So he was working 24 hours on, 24 hours off. Him and his wife were the attendant of Osensei and his wife. And he was just there training with him all the time in Iwama. Half the time Osensei was in Tokyo, but when he was there, so he was there. And um, Osensei passed away, and Saito Sensei was kind of forgotten a little bit there in Iwama for some years after Osensei's death, and then people started to discover him, and he felt it was his life's mission to preserve Osensei's Aikido. And um, that, was his, that was his big teaching, that was his big message, that we're preserving Osensei's Aikido, we're preserving Osensei's Aikido. He also tended to be a little bit critical of other styles, Oh, they're not doing what O Sensei did, or other teachers, excuse me. They're not doing what O Sensei did, they're not doing what O Sensei did. He loved to commune with those teachers and hang out with them, and, and he wouldn't even call them. And the thing is, he was senior to most of the people when I was in Japan. He was senior to most of them, so they all basically bowed down and listened to him, and whatever. 
you know, he had space for other teachers, but he did say that this is Osensei's dojo and we're preserving Osensei's Aikido. Now, that was an awesome thing because, it, you know, you had a very clear system that you were preserving and learning. But it didn't always serve knowledge. And it's very much, you know, a little bit of the emperor's new clothes where everybody kind of goes along with the preservation thing and, um, and you're not allowed to ask critical questions. Critical reasoning can be shut down in a, in a system of preservation. It's tradition. You don't question tradition. Why? Because of sensei in Japanese martial arts, it's just bam, they'll throw you out of the dojo like that. Then problem solved. But not really. So, you know, my suggestion for somebody who's looking for a teacher is to look for someone. Sure, they're going to be teaching you a system, a style, and maybe even a story. You know, maybe there's a, there's an origin, origin story, and there's a kind of a story that finds your place in the universe through this style of Aikido. Fine. All good. Inspiring stuff. But is, is the style more important? Or is learning and true knowledge more important? Um, and uh, that's very, very, uh, they're two very different things. Um, I would suggest to look for somebody who's a non-preservationist. It's cool if they're preserving, but, but if they have an authentic transmission. The thing is, imagine you're learning a technique, and you, and you copy it exactly like your teacher, and that's what we should do. At a certain point, the more we copy that form, we'll start to come into contact with the principles that are underlying that form. The more you come into contact, and this is super, super important, the more you come into contact with the principles, the more it will affect and change the form. The more you come into contact with the principles, the more those principles will begin to change the way you do things. They'll change the form. The more you preserve the form, the more it'll kind of shut down the principles. It'll shut down the spirituality. This is a fact. So I would highly, I always suggest, you know, I, by the way, I'm a technician. I love sharp technique and, you know, I love, but my technique's evolving and, you know, and, and, um, and it, it's evolving because I'm always open to more learning and more knowledge. When I meet other teachers and hang out with other teachers, they're, what they're teaching penetrates me and it impacts me and it changes me. Uh, and I would hope that, you know, the same happens with my students. So again, point number four. When you're looking for a teacher, look for somebody who's more important and puts more uh, uh, weight in learning and knowledge than they do in preservation. Um, uh, the, this, look for somebody who, is a, who leads, uh, leads the context as a perpetual learner. So they're, they're actually demonstrating that they are always learning. Look for a perpetual learner. Uh, look for somebody um, who is transparent in their motivations and intentions. Now that doesn't mean that we, we you know, I have to give you all the, I, I can have my privacy, and transparent, but my motivation and intention should be clear. And, and if you, you and, and you're allowed to question, you know, you're allowed to question. That's why I say, put learning and knowledge above. I can say, well, look, that's private. You know, that's fine. That's a cool answer. And if you're not satisfied, you can leave. But you're allowed to question. In preservation styles, you're not allowed to question. Questions are shut down. So transparency is important. Now you can also transparent. Let's not be dualistic. If you have transparency, you can also have privacy. But the question, but the point is, questions are allowed. They're not shut down. Um, to learn means to constantly humble your, yourself. You know, every time we learn something new, I'm humbling myself. I'm humbling myself. I'm humbling myself. Clone yourself, Miles, please. Yeah, sorry, Kelly. <laughs> um, when we learn, every time we learn, the old part of me that didn't understand that yet is humbled. So humility is such an important quality of a teacher. They could be charismatic and flashy and, you know, and whatever. But when you get into the mo a learning moment, there's a humility there. That's, uh, that's so beautiful. And that's something I would highly recommend to see, to look for. Uh, also look for a teacher that has learned how to translate the wisdom at the core of Aikido directly into your cultural understanding. So, you know, the wisdom at the core of Aikido is universal. The forms are particular, you know, they started with Japan and then all these different styles. But the way that they teach that, the way that they express it, the way they share it with you is that they, they translate this wisdom into a cultural language that you can you can take it in. 
Yeah. So you know, if we're Western, or most of us probably watching this are Westerners. So if we're you know if we're demanded to walk around and bow like Japanese all the time, I can do that. Sure. In fact, I did it for years. But it's not me. So that's not that's what I mean. I'm translating into my culture. Sure. Let's show. Bowing is about respect. Beautiful. Let's learn about respect in the forms. Aikido begins with respect. Aikido ends with respect. Aikido wa reini hajimaru, reini awaru. It begins and ends with respect. We can bow like Japanese, or we can just show respect in whatever cultural way we show respect. Okay, I see a bunch of comments coming up. I'm going to jump back to these comments in a second. So I've got one more point. So again, I'll review these four points on um, five ways to choose a teacher. Number one, know what you want when you're choosing a teacher. Number two, look for someone who resonates with you, that you feel a connection with when you're choosing a teacher. Number three, look for a teacher, somebody who has lineage. And if they don't have lineage, they have to have direct spiritual access, which is a lineage in and of itself. Number four, look for someone who puts learning and knowledge above preservation, which is a big deal in Aikido because there's a lot of preservationists out there. And number five, of the five ways when choosing an Aikido teacher, look for someone who inspires you to live your life to its fullest potential. Look for someone who inspires you to live your life to its fullest potential. Wow, that's a sensei. That sensei, a, a man or a woman who has lived before us. And then they, by living before us, they turn around and they say, this is who I am. I'm somewhere along the path. There's more to go, but they inspire you to live your life to its fullest potential. So this means that they are able to put your unfolding potential above everything else. You walk in the door, yeah, there's things that we're going to go through. There's things you're going to learn, but first, and, and you're probably going to resist, and you're probably going to contract, and maybe I'm going to have a bad day or whatever. But first and foremost, your potential is really what this is all about my potential as well, but since I'm teaching or the teacher's teaching, it's about the student's potential. Um, such a teacher that is, you know, inspires you to live your life to your fullest potential, uh, they will indeed challenge you. You know, they'll challenge you just like the, the path. Anytime you walk along the path, sooner or later, usually sooner, you're the, the, the lower parts of yourself, you know, you're more kind of, let's say you're contracted, fixated, instinctual parts of yourself will be challenged by the higher path of practice. This is how it is. If you're not challenged, it's not a path of practice. It's a practice, but it's not a higher path of practice. So you will be challenged. And the teacher as a living manifestation of the potential on that path will stand there and say, either just show you or, or look at you or say something. They will challenge you. You know, when you contract away from your potential, there the teacher is there to challenge you. They will challenge you. And at the same time, they will always encourage you. Hey, the way is forward. The way is forward. The way is forward. They will always encourage you. But at the same time, they will support you. They'll support you when you are having a challenging time. They will support you when you have taken a wrong turn. They will support you when you have backslid. They will support you when you have fallen into a pit, pitfall. They will support you when it's just not happening. They will support you. Some teachers are more on the challenge side. Some teachers are more on the support side. Some teachers do both of those and with different students, different ways. It doesn't matter. The teacher is actually there because they're committed, because they're in this for your potential. Uh, they will both challenge and support you along the path. And they will always reflect to you that you can do it. Many men and women have walked this path before me. Many men and women have walked this path before you. Many women, men and women will continue to walk this path for eons to come. Why are you and I any different? You know, so let's always remember that you can do it, that we can do it. And finally, even though um, sometimes this, this, this kind of gets a little bit into the goal orientation uh, I don't want to kind of emphasize that too much. I will say that a teacher who is in this, who will aspire you to live your life to its fullest potential, will always reflect to you that, you know, who you are right here and right now is actually perfect in and of itself. Just be more of that, commit to your practice, and things will unfold. 
So these are the five. These are the five uh, ways to choose a teacher. Once again, I'll review them. Number one, when you're looking for a teacher, know what you want. Number two, when you're looking for a teacher, look for someone who resonates with you. Number three, when you're looking for a teacher, an Aikido teacher, look for someone who is connected to lineage. And that lineage, by the way, should also resonate with you. There's a lot of different lineages. That should resonate with you. Your teacher would be great, but their, their teacher was maybe a, a jerk or whatever. That's, that's, that's the lineage. So consider lineage. When you're uh, choosing an Aikido teacher, look for someone who puts learning and knowledge above preservation. And the fifth point when uh, choosing an Aikido teacher is that you should look for someone who inspires you to live your life to its fullest potential. So now before I go to your questions, I, I, I will say um, one last thing. And that is that the last thing that the world needs is another Aikido teacher. Really. The last thing that this world needs is another Aikido student. It means nothing. What this world actually needs are men and women who are dedicated to walking the higher path of Aiki, dedicated to walking the higher path of what the core essence of Aikido is. We walk the, the path uh, in, as a, of commitment towards resolving conflict, staying open, meeting, present in conflict, and somehow resolving it. That's what this world needs. Another teacher, another student, uh, what the world needs are men and women who are committed to and dedicated to walking a higher path of practice. Thank you very much. I want to wish you all a good day, a good evening, and good Aikido. Take care. Bye-bye.